the reader. Today's topic, permaculture. If you're a bit hazy on what that is, stay with us. Jude Hobbs has been creating sustainable, self-sufficient agricultural ecosystems for 30 years. She is an internationally known land consultant, designer, and educator, specializing in optimizing resource conservation, biodiversity, watershed enhancement, and income diversification. A co-founder of two permaculture professional development organizations, Jude works extensively in the agriculture industry through her consulting firm, Agroecology Northwest. She also tends Wilson Creek Gardens, a seven-acre homestead and permaculture demonstration site outside Cottage Grove, Oregon. Welcome, Jude. Thank Thanks you. for being on the show. I'm really very interested to hear more about permaculture. It's something that I kind of am aware of in a peripheral way, but I've never really known that much about it. So I'm excited to hear about what you do. Great. Thanks for inviting me. Great to have you. So um, what is this that you do? <laughs> what is permaculture? Uh, I like to define <coughs> permaculture as a uh, new buzzword for an old way of being. If you think about our ancestors and how they uh, lived very communally, very, uh, everything was local, resources, and, and that's really what permaculture is, is thinking about how you can design systems, whether it's your own home system or community systems, so that you create more self-reliance with, with your, within yourself and within your neighbors. And I have a series of slides to show you, which will help demonstrate what I'm talking about. Great. So we're just going to start out with the first slide, which is um, the founders of permaculture, <coughs> and that's <coughs> Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And Bill Mollison originally uh, came up with this idea in the early to mid-70s. And he wrote several books. And they're very informative. And they talk about whole systems design. And that's really what permaculture is about, is designing, thinking about all parts of a system. And I'll talk more about that. The other um, person is David Holmgren who was a student of his, and they did an experiment on 300 uh, s plots, a half acre each, and they designed them with a wide variety of plants, which we call polyculture, many different plants, mm -hmm. and how do they fit together, and, and they saw how well that it worked. And one of the things that was very interesting is that he, Bill Mollison, had an opportunity to be interviewed on the radio, and he talked about what permaculture is and how it functions. And he gave out his address and phone number. And within a week, about 5,000 people responded. Oh, because grief. I know it was amazing because they said, you voiced um, something that we've been thinking about and you've given us a way to act. And that's why I'm so really enchanted with permaculture and utilize it in my daily life is because it, it, it's a toolbox, a, a guide of how to um, proceed with um, designing. So, and we're all designers. People think, oh, I'm not a designer, but um, you know, one moves into a house and they, they set up their kitchen and, okay, where's the best place for the silverware? Or they go into their bedroom and go, where should we put our bed so that it's, you know, in the right place? So the next slide. Um, so Masanobu Fukuoka, um, he w was a Japanese farmer and he practiced um, a, a different type of farming, no-till, and this was in the early 60s. He, he wrote a book called One Straw Revolution and also The Natural Way of Farming. And Bill Mollison read about his work and realized that the, the idea is to um, do keen observation first. Do nothing until you've observed, and then after you've done enough observation, then you can act. Um, in a timely manner. So if you're observing when the la last frost date is, um, then you figure, oh, that's when I can plant my tomatoes. So that's kind of the idea of, is just doing keen observation. So the next slide. So permaculture started out originally as a, uh, a way of designing systems for more permanent agriculture. And as time has gone on, it is more about designing whole systems for more permanent culture. And so we do that by incorporating a wide variety of aspects such as um, water catchment and working with plants and working with appropriate technology and 
So that's sort of, that's sort of the um, evolution of permaculture moving forward to change the way that we design homesteads or our lives in community. So the next slide. So the way that would work, I suppose, in practical matters is you wouldn't be wearing out your environment. Mm -hmm. You would be making it self-sustainable. That's right. And yeah. uh, making it work better for your own needs. Mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. It's, for me, as a designer, <clears throat> I think of function and aesthetics. For, um, I, I, I believe that the, as a designer, it should be beautiful and incredibly functional. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to accomplish if you're just thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. So the next slide. Um, and so the, this is about indigenous wisdom and, and the story of place. And so if you really get to, like in here where the Kalapuya was, the local tribes people, and having a sense of where you are helps you do design. And so what, what Mollison, his basis was really observing indigenous cultures and then emulating that and seeing what was successful for them and then designing accordingly. And so the next slide is an example of some of, this is Wilson Creek Gardens where we live. And so there's a year round creek and there's um, greenhouses and a, a hoop house and a wide variety of aspects that, and edible landscaping, that is my main, one of my main focus in design. And along with that, the idea of bringing forth um, the other elements that we'll talk about in, in the whole system. And so I'm practicing it and learning from my own mistakes, which is a really um, important um, principle in permaculture. So we'll see that in the next slide. So even oh. after 30 plus years in this field, you still feel like you're making mistakes? I make mistakes and I learn from those mistakes <laughs> and I really value that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the, the next slide was just about um, sustainability and how we hear that word and it can be a buzzword. I think it's a very functional word because I think of it as a three-legged stool. And so you have the environment, you have the community, and you have economics. And you really need to have all of them. If one of those legs drops off, then it's going to collapse. And that's really what's happening right now in the state of the world is that there is a sense of uh, change where there is you know, some are concerned about the, the nature of collapse and that the environment is particularly struggling and along with humans struggling. Mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah. So, next. So, permaculture, it's an approach to whole systems design and thinking. And so, so we think, like, what does that mean as a whole system? And so, the next slide. So, ecological design. So it's permaculture is ecological design. It's adapted to any climate, cultural condition, or scale. And you can utilize those same principles anywhere in the world. And that's what's so fascinating to me is that, um, that, you, that as we go through, you'll see some, some of the principles and that they, it's really about the, str the, um, the strategies or the whole picture is what the principles are, and the techniques are the systems that you apply those principles. Mm -hmm. So next slide. Um, so we think about permaculture as a decision-making tool, and it's based on these principles. So we've got this toolbox. Next. So the toolbox is a way to help you make decisions. In our lives, we have so many decisions. And so that slide was just about um, you've got all these different um, ways to go. And so many decisions like, OK, for me, it was like uh, we moved to our site. I knew I wanted to have chickens, but I could not figure out where to put the chickens. Yeah, so you, that issue. you <laughs> weigh and measure all these different, different locations. And so what I decided to do is put them as close to the kitchen as I could. There's a living hedge that blocks it from the kitchen, and there's also a deck there. But I can have an apple core and throw it over and feed the chicken. <laughs> I can hear that they're doing OK. I can make sure that I'm managing them properly, because if it starts smelling, because chickens can, are definitely great manure producers, um, then I know I need to add some straw or carbon to take care of them, because mm -hmm. hygiene is so important. So animals are also part of a permaculture system, or they can be. They mm -hmm. don't have to totally be. So the next slide. Um, so permaculture has three ethics. One is caring for the earth, care for people, 
and uh, sharing the surplus. And so this slide is an example of thinking of seven generations. This is a children's daycare center, and they were going by this garden and teaching. Um, the, the woman was teaching the kids about gardening. And so we think about how can we, how, th this three, kind of like a sustainability, the three ways that we can really be um, utilizing permaculture in an ethical way, caring for the earth, caring for people, and sharing the surplus. Mm -hmm. So next. So this uh, slide just gives you an example of the permaculture design process, which uh, is, um, did, did we finish looking at that? <laughs> It'd be great to go back if we could. Yes, wonderful. So you're starting at the bottom, and you're, um, one of the things in, they, they know, to note is that you're observing patterns in nature and you're using them as an example. When you're designing any site, you're doing a site analysis. You're also doing the implementation and then you're observing what is it, uh, kind of getting feedback. You're evaluating it and learning from your mistakes and then sort of the whole process goes again. Mm -hmm. So the next slide is just a, um, kind of a, an example of keen observation because that's really our first and most important um, what are we looking principle. at there, exactly? And so you're looking, this is somebody's winter decoration, right? And I'm driving along oh, and I see this. Skier. So there's a little ski slope there. It's hard to see. And it's this, this of course, fake person slapped against the house. And so it's like, <laughs> for me, it's like, oh, some keen observation. Like, what is going on in this picture? And so, and that you can utilize for any kinds of systems. But I do a lot of teaching. And so I like to have kind of humorous slides. <laughs> Get people's attention. <laughs> so the, the lesson here is observe that house in, in the area where you are skiing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to exactly. Avoid it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the next slide is about observing and reading the land and letting that land speak to you. So that really is the observation that we're looking for. So, you know, even if you're in a desert environment or you're in a temperate environment, you're utilizing the same principles. You're still reading the land. Where's the sun come up? Um, how much sun do you have during the day? What is your water source? And um, where's the best place to put your garden? All those things you're going to take into consideration no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. So next slide. So this is an example of a uh, designing with nature in mind. If you've ever seen the fiddlehead ferns, they kind of unfold yes. and they're a spiral. And so in that example, there was someone who had a pretty steep slope and they used the spiral example with local rock to build their garden. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to have a garden. So that was an example of observing nature and then applying something in a human-made landscape that would um, be as an example kind of for that. Mimicked uh, the, that natural environment in a way. Exactly. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of herbal spirals in permaculture design. So that's another example of the spiral pattern. Next slide. So wherever you are, what we're encouraging is to, to harvest water. Har water is our most precious resource. And in the, we have lots of it usually in the winter time. And so in the a permaculture design is, what would be a way that you could collect water? And collecting roof water is a really effective and simple way of doing that. You can use a small tank, like that was a wine barrel, or you can use 3,000 or 5,000 gallon tanks, and more and more people are utilizing it here in the US. In other cultures, in Hawaii, they have water catchment all the time, and they have really large tanks. So that's one of the systems. So we talked about the principles, and giving us ways to act. And now we're talking about the different systems that we can include in a permaculture, um, a, um, a, a permaculture design. So, yes. If you're harvesting water, do you have to have some kind of special technology in place to keep the water clean? There are, uh, and now even Jerry's and different places have uh, little clean outs. And um, so, yes, you want to make sure that there isn't a lot of debris going into the tanks. And one of the things that um, is so wonderful about Google is that you can, if there's anything that interests you in this conversation that we have, like water harvesting or rainwater catchment, all you have to do is Google it and you will find out everything you ever wanted to know about, about designing those systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next. Um, and so all systems need management. So if you have water, the raccoons tend to come. So I just want to point it out that it's really important whether you have animals or you have water, um, gardens, everything needs to be tended. So next. So 
so systems need tending. This is a gray water, that was a gr an example of a gray water system. And there is an organization called OLGA, Oregon Legal Gray Water Association. It is now legal to have gray water in Oregon. And gray water is all the water that comes out of a house, excepting that which comes from the bathroom, the mm -hmm. toilet. So you can do um, washing machine water, or um, Dish, shower water, dishwasher, dishwasher, dishwasher water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd be mindful of your soaps. Yeah. So next. So building soil, of course, to have healthy gardens, we need to have healthy soil. So it's another part of the system. Go ahead. next slide. And you can build soil even in even if you live in an apartment. You could have vermicomposting, which is worm composting, mm -hmm. in a little box, and you put your kitchen scraps in there, and that those worms will provide. Um, nutrients for your house plants or if you have a little balcony and you have a garden balcony. So that's part of like closing the loops that we were talking about, is building soil wherever you are to feed the plants that you're growing. Mm -hmm. So next. Um, and then animals and what is their place in the system. So we've talked about water catchment, we've talked about plants, we've talked about animals, and I like to have animals and um, there's uh, in order to, and there was two little chicks under Zara's uh, it was hard to see them on her shoulders, but she was in charge of taking care of the chicks she learned early on. It was a really great way for kids to become involved in caring for some of these systems. And so um, having animals, not only can they feed us, but they can also produce the manure for enhancing the quality of the soil. They'll scratch for bugs and that sort of thing. Next. So turn challenges into solutions. That's one uh, a really wonderful permaculture principle. I love challenges. When I go to a site with a client, it's like they have too much water and they don't know what to do with it. Or they, you know, how do you close the loops for nutrients and how do you build compost? And um, so, so a lot of people are, um, you know, they'll call me and they're like pulling their hair out because they don't know how to deal with certain challenges. I like to call them challenges versus problems. And uh, so, so permaculture is one of its really primary principles is turning those constraints into resources. Like if you have too much water on the land, what about putting a pond in to collecting the water and have that high on the land and then gravity feed it down to the garden? Mm -hmm. So that would be an example. So next. Uh, so urban permaculture, small and intensive landscapes. So we, so again, we talked about different scales. We can talk, we, we can do large scale permaculture sites or, or smaller. And in that example, we saw, um, um, a, you know, there was recycled bricks, there was some natural locally made willow furniture, and then on the other side was a sm uh, beds, small raised bed garden. So that was in a small city lot. So you can really, without having lawn, you can have a whole lot of um, systems in place. You can do water catchment, grow food, and, and that sort of thing. So that's in an urban environment. Next. And then this is um, another great principles, simple solutions for a great effect. So imagine that you see that greenhouse and if you raise the roof of the greenhouse so that it, it encompassed that window, that would provide passive solar heat to the house. So that would be a simple solution for a great effect. Mm -hmm. That's another principle that I find really fun and, um, and, and very valuable. So simple solutions for a great effect. And next. So, uh, and this is make the most change for the least effort. So uh, it says bad news makes good soil. So um, when we moved um, into to Eugene, we had a place with lots of lawn and what we ended up doing was laying newspaper down, putting some manure down and creating like lasagna gardening, yes. if you've heard that term. I where do you, it I love it, it's <laughs> great, it's really functional. And, um, and so the next slide just gives you an example of moving from uh, what was lots of lawn to six years later was a really full and luscious garden. There's peach trees, oh. plums, blueberries, strawberries, just in that one same area where that previous picture was. So uh, that's simple solutions for great effects, is just taking a, uh, an area and doing lasagna gardening. Mm -hmm. So next. So people ask me, oh, you're into permaculture and you m only must be into native plants. Well, um, I, it would be really hard to live on native plants alone, though it is really important to think about what is grown um, naturally in the environment where we are, utilizing them in the right place because they take less care over the long haul. 
And right. they're so good for pollinators. And they're great pollinators, and there's great fruit, like the huckleberry is a wonderful plant. It's evergreen. I use that a lot in the edible landscape. It does well in the shade, and it produces delicious fruit. Mm -hmm. So, next. Um, so, small scale intensive is another principle. And here, this is at our eco village in um, British Columbia. And this is a kid's play structure that they made, made out of a cob structure with a living roof. And so that, again, very small scale, really intensive, really functional. So another permaculture principle. And um, you can do that with gardening. I really encourage people to actually start really small in their garden, have success, and then get a little bigger. And to, to me, it's really important to have success in all of your, um, any of the systems that you're putting in. So you, you were featuring a structure there. Mm -hmm. When you are working on a permaculture design, do you, are you, are you designing structures, garden spaces, animal spaces all at the same time? Well, one could do it all the time uh, at the same time, but it really depends. It's a classic answer in permaculture or in any, you know, it's like, it really does depend what is the needs. When I'm working with someone, we talk about the wish list and the need list. What's the most important thing? Well, if it's a, a bare piece of land, having a house first might be the most important part. So then designing a house, utilizing local resources as much as possible, local materials, um, sustainably harvested materials, uh, thinking about what appropriate technology you're going to want to include, and then designing in roof water catchment as part of the home, as an example, and then citing where the garden might be or could be, um, where the animals could be. So yeah, thinking about that, that's that whole systems thinking that mm -hmm. I was talking about. Yeah. So, you next. know, I, I had a house built, um, it's been less than a year now that I've mm -hmm. been in the house, and I, when it was in its design phases, I was really arguing for having a roof catchment system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was discouraged from doing that because mm -hmm. I was told that we get so much rain here that we would very, very quickly fill up a rain barrel or, or whatever, and it was actually more useful to let the water just run onto the ground and recharge the groundwater. This, what do you think about this that? This is a great, great um, point. So for me, and for most people who do rainwater catchment, I'm filling my, my um, catchment systems, and I use wine barrels a lot because I have an opportunity to get them pretty readily, and, and then I have an overflow. So, so I do two different things. I, you always have an overflow, no matter any time you're catching water, whether it's in a pond or in a container. But I also have it so that I can take the downspout and reconnect it to, you can, in the city, you can reconnect it to the storm drain. Mm -hmm. So once the tanks are full, and that goes back to management, then you can put the downspout in. It takes me about two minutes to do that. And then the water is, you know, it is um, going back to the land or going back to the, wa um, to the Willamette River in, the, in your case. And no, then, in my case. I okay, you're in the country. country too. So then you, it would still be, you're, you're still recharging the water, the aquifers, because it's going back. So, so either way, even if you have an overflow or if you have a, um, if you're just um, uh, putting it back into, like, I'm not sure where your water's going now, if it's just going into... It's probably just going out into. It's just an, going out into the right. So the you're ground. recharging anyway. So mm. so so you have a tank of water, and one of my tanks is close to the greenhouse. So instead of turn, and I too live in the country, and so instead of turning the tap water and having the electrical pump to water my greenhouse, I'm utilizing my. Um, my water catchment system. See, that's precisely why I want. Well, you it. can still do that. You can still do that. You can disconnect your downspout, and you can, um, you can, you can design it in. So yeah. it, it's not. Well, I suppose there could be situations where you could not retrofit something like that, but in you know, most, most cases, of the cases you can. You can. I, I, I can't imagine one that you couldn't. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Well, great that's good question. To know. Yeah. Fear not. Okay, next slide. <laughs> um, so appropriate technology, that's another part of what permaculture is. And appropriate technology, what does that mean? Well, most people think of solar and wind and um, maybe hydroelectric. And that might not be economically practical for many people. And so I think of appropriate technology in a way that even um, like putting on heavy curtains so that in the wintertime you're conserving heat or um, putting gaskets on your electrical outlets. I mean, there's very simple solutions that will have great effects 
utilizing appropriate technologies. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another part of the system in a permaculture um, design process. So next. And this is an example of renewable resources. This is a community uh, in California, and it is just showing you solar. You know, this is where they're, you know, having solar power and that, and that they're also giving back to the grid. So, and solar is great. It's becoming more economically viable. And especially in the summertime here, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, if, it, if it costs out, it makes lots of it's sense. It's well worth yeah. having. I have solar panels. That's great. And I was just amazed at how tiny my electric bills were last yes, year. It's incredible, right. Yeah. And so, and it's interesting, I'll give you an example. Um, where I live, um, the previous people, before we bought the place, I said, well, what's your electric bill? And they said, oh, it's about $300 a month. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow. And so, and, um, and so, of course, we knew that that wasn't going to be our particular scenario. And so we put curtains on, we really insulated more. And then, um, and we heat with wood. We have a wood insert, even though we have electrical as a backup. And the, our bills now are $50 a month. And that's because we're conserving and we're, um, mostly I think it's we're conserving. And we, you know, we've switched our light bulbs out and we've done all these different things to be really mindful about conservation. Yeah. So that you really can. And we're, we, we actually, since we have done all of that, we burn uh, two less cords of wood per year. So, I know, that's it's pretty great. phenomenal. Yeah. So it's, to me, that's appropriate technology. So that's really thinking about, you know, what kind of technology and making heavy-duty curtains or buying curtains. Yeah, this is all very doable stuff. It's all doable. Anybody can, can look this stuff up and figure out how to do it. Exactly. Yeah, it's, not, exactly. it's not for the elites. That's exactly right. Exactly. And if, if you're a renter, you can do the same thing. You can go to a thrift shop and you can get, you know, heavy blankets or, you know, something to put on the curtains, it's, uh, on the windows. Or. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. So natural building uh, goes along with the idea of um, uh, building and, and what makes sense. You know, some people, this is Cobb, and, and as an example, um, there are lots of different ways of building and utilizing material. Again, like we talked about, you know, what's in this particular region, you know, using wood m makes a lot of sense because we have um, abundant forest. Uh, one of the things is we think about in designing our forests and designing, harvesting our forests, um, I would love to, uh, many, especially forest people who are interested in preserving forests and, and thinking about ways of being more sustainable instead of clear cutting forests, how can we do selective harvesting and really be nurturing our forests? Um, I've, I believe in forest farming in a sustainable kind of way because mm -hmm. we are using a lot of wood. And and fir trees grow great here. I mean, it's a great local resource. Let's think about how can we utilize this resource in a more effective way, mm -hmm. caring way. And that goes, that's another ethic of, you know, caring for the earth as well. Have you, uh, this is just curiosity, have you found that the timber industry is open to that kind of conversation? Um, I would say that I can't, I'm not really sure about that. I know that there are parts of the timber industry that do sustainable forestry mm -hmm. that will, um, and they market it as that and they get more money for that. So, so there is an economic value to yes. sustainable wood harvesting, forest mm -hmm. harvesting. Uh, and the conversation as time goes on may change and being more political active to help create that change might be effective. I can only hope over time. Yeah, I've gotten the impression, I'm not, I'm not from Oregon. I have not been here for very long, but I've gotten the impression that uh, they're, they're, th that conversation is just so fraught, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, very, very tense, and people tend to fall on one side or the other mm -hmm. and get rigid in mm -hmm. their position and are not not necessarily open to hearing what the other side's mm -hmm. concerns are. And mm -hmm. I just wondered what, I was just curious yeah, wondered what your it's, experience it's, was. It's interesting. Um, th there was a fellow, there's a fellow, his name um, is uh, Alan Savory, and he had, do, uh, he's, um, he did a whole, um, um, holistic management. He's written books on that. And he was asked, he was in the Midwest, and he was asked, um, by 
uh, there was environmentalists and there were the ranchers and they were really angry with each other and they couldn't talk and they were just like you know and so they were on one side and they were in an auditorium and he was asked to come and talk and they said what are you even bothering for don't even come you know da 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 so there you know there's the two opposing sides on different and he says, give me five minutes of your time. Would you just give me five minutes? And they said, oh, OK, begrudgingly. And he said, go out to your pickup. Go out, sit by a tree. Tell me, what is it that you want to see your community look like in five years, in 10 years, in 50 years? Come back, and let's talk about that. And so what do you think happened? They all wanted the same thing. <laughs> they all wanted the same thing. They wanted, you know, a good environment for their families. They wanted to have a, a solid income. I mean, all these different things. And so then the conversation could begin. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we really do. I mean, everybody wants to be, um, have more care for the environment for their children and mm -hmm. their grandchildren. So it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. that's helpful. Good. <laughs> um, next slide. So innovative housing, this is just sort of a fun slide, you know, thinking about, okay, how can we have innovative housing? Um, and innovative housing can be cob, it can be straw bale, it can be a wide variety of things. Okay, next slide. So village homes, this is an example in California. Uh, Michael Corbett um, designed this. And if you ever have an opportunity to go there, they really, it's a fabulous community that is definitely permaculture based. They collect water, they have lots of appropriate technology, they grow lots of food. And I just wanted to show that as an example of, of a large scale, um, full on permaculture design system. So this is an entire community uh, that uh, mm -hmm. could be called a permaculture Absolutely. community. Absolutely. They have income cool. production, res they have um, um, restaurant there, they have childcare, they've got you know, a wide variety of things. It's, a, it's an intentional community and they have shared bikes and tools and that sort of thing. It's not co-housing, but it's in a, more of an intentional awareness. And I, I was there a couple of years ago and I was just amazed at all the food. And then, you know, they have, you know, systems so that an amphitheater in the summer and in the wintertime, it's a pond, it holds water. And so, yeah, it's really pretty interesting. Does anybody accuse you of being a throwback to hippies and living in a co-op or <coughs> being a communist? Ooh, how exciting. No, I haven't really been targeted as that. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, being alternative, you know, I, you know, would be considered probably a lot of these ideas are alternative. I think of it as more progressive. Mm -hmm. Let's think about how we can really shape the future mm -hmm. with these ideas that um, is, are really caring for the earth and for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next slide. So urban per permaculture, I just love this uh, picture where you see there's the whole array of um, the other person's balcony on the left, there's nothing going on. But here they've got bikes, they've got plants, <laughs> they've got, you know, um, some chimes that they've made and they're stacking. And that's another permaculture principle is how, how many different elements can you have within one space? So that, that's just an example of perma urban permaculture. Next. So invisible structures is another part of what permaculture is. And this is a community wheel. And I won't go through all the aspects of this wheel. But let's say, you know, it, right there it says education. Firstly, we need to educate ourselves and our children about the potentials of working together. And, and also um, utilizing grassroots organizations. Here we have um, grassroots gardens. We have... Um, school garden projects, all these wonderful opportunities for growing food together. And um, there's a Eugene Permaculture Guild where, where people, um, there's, it's a listserv of communication for sharing resources. And so, so invisible structures, so that's, so again, it's not just gardening, it's, just not, it's not just the forest and the plants and the, and the animals, it's really community-based thinking, mm -hmm. community-based thinking. And that means people have to talk to each other. And that's true. That's mm -hmm. true. And meeting so, and part of that is neighborhood associations and getting involved with your neighborhood. And the next slide shows an example of, in Portland, community building the city repair project. And they're also doing that here in Eugene, where they're taking intersections, they're painting them, and then they're putting these kiosks um, on, on each corner to slow traffic down, to build more community. And the kiosks could be plant exchange, a library, a little tea station, a kid's structure. And so it's beautiful as well as functional. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, slowing traffic is really kind of important. 
wherever you are. Next. <laughs> Oh, and this is, you know, I talk about a lot about um, right livelihood, and um, this is Eugene's farmer's market, and the woman here is just showing that she, you know, has seed packets, she has um, plants that she's raised, she's uh, made baskets, and that she also has a little pond, and she's selling uh, for $2 a gallon um, fish manure tea because she has fish in her pond, and so she's using that as an economic resource. And the Buddhist, it's a right livelihood is a Buddhist term, and I love to think about that because many of us are trying to find ways to enhance our income. And so when I think about permaculture, I think about whole systems design, I think about how can we um, diversify our, our income. I have four ways I make a living, and so, it's, and so like if one fails, then there's another one to, um, pick up the pieces in, in essence. And so I think it's really, you know, we think, um, I used to talk about, you know, follow your passion. Well, maybe we don't have a particular passion that we're interested, but what about our curiosity? It's like, mm -hmm. let's follow our curiosity and see where that takes us. And maybe you might be able to earn some income by following that. That's so. a great way of putting it, mm -hmm. following your curiosity. Yeah. yeah. So next. Oh, I love this slide. This is um, a janitorial service, and it's called Positive Solutions. And it says, you too can make a difference. And, uh, and really, permaculture started with Bill Mollison, who was very uh, negative about what was happening in the state of the world. He just was like, it was hard for him to get up every morning. It's like, well, it's, it's so terrible. Everything's so terrible. And then he realized, you know, I'm tired of this. I want to think about being positive. And so he coined the term positivism. And so it's like, okay, that's what permaculture is to me. That's what this systems thinking is. It's, it's a positive way to get up every morning and think, what can I do to make the world a better place, to make you know, my community a better place, uh, where I live a better place? And to me, it's, um, I, I, I pretty much stopped listening to news as much as possible. I mean, it still filters in, but it's... Um, I'm still politically active on, in certain levels, though that everyday part that's kind of challenging for me, I've just chosen to, like, what can I do um, in my world to be more positive? So I love the term positivism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot more useful than waking up uh, depressed every morning, isn't it? It is. It truly really is. So next. And so along with that positivism is being sol solutionaries. And I don't remember the woman's name, but she, she was a high school teacher, and she did a TED Talk, and she talked about how can, how can we have solutions. And so on the right side was uh, two of my students, and they were working together to solve some, some serious questions in a design process. And the one on the left side if you, uh, was a basket of sedums that this landscaper had on the front of his truck. And so it was a way for him, and he did edible landscaping, and so he was a solutionary because he, you know, he brought food and all kinds of great designs to people's homes and yards, but he also had this great little attention getter of having live plants on his truck. So I thought that was kind of a fun idea as a solutionary. And the next... Um, and also being a solutionary uh, is being, for some people, who their comfort level is, this is vote with your fork. It's a political activism. Uh, if we are not comfortable with certain policies, uh, especially in um, certain producers or certain companies, um, choosing not to support those companies or stores uh, is a way to be politically active in a, a mindful kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that's also part of that invisible structures that I think about in whole systems, in, in life's choices. So next. So the user must pay. These, this is um, uh, a, a collection of um, trees that we harvested and pot up and then give away. I use a lot of paper, even though a lot, it's recycled or one-sided paper. And so I am... Um, working on just um, getting more plants out into the ground. Uh, and so um, that's when I lived in Eugene and had a small space now that I have seven acres, 
there's um, I'm planting hundreds and hundreds of trees to just be kind of giving back that that kind of pay it forward oh, kind of that, idea in return for having used all the, yes. the paper. Mm -hmm, I understand. Mm -hmm. Or you know using wood products or whatever. However, mm -hmm. so that's just another principle of what permaculture is. Next. And then this is a sort of a joke. This is before per, uh, permaculture, and it's not a joke actually. Um, but this is a desert environment. And then the next slide is kind of a fun example, and this is off of the web. And, and if you look closely, those, that scene is actually food. There's broccoli as the forest and that sort of thing. But to, to note that um, there is a, there's an organization called the Chukukwa Project, and it's based in Zimbabwe. And they are practicing permaculture, and they started out with one village, about uh, 50 people, and now they're up to 100,000 people that are incorporating permaculture principles in a, in a desert environment where they are, again, closing the loops, utilizing all the materials that are readily available. They're planting trees. And in that planting of trees, it's bringing the water back. And so it's really a phenomenal um, So they're reversing uh, desertification. They are. They are reversing. I had not I heard of such a thing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. That's just fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was possible. Yes, it is. And, and really, it is, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a lovely children's story, and they have a, a, a movie, a little film on it. It's called The Man Who Planted Happy, uh, Grew Trees and Blue, and um, The Man Who uh, Planted Trees and Grew Happiness. And it's about going and planting oak trees. He collected um, acorns, and he planted oak trees, and then the water in the forest, in the, in the, in the desert environment, and then the water came back, and w how that impacts, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. So, so the, the group in Zimbabwe, how long have they been doing this? I think it's been about 12 years. I'm not 100% so sure, but it's taking time, not very long. but not very long. Yeah, and it's a great, um, it's a really, it's an excellent d DVD. Yeah. Wow. So next. So permaculture is a revolution disguised as organic gardening. <laughs> People say, oh, you're into organic gardening. I've got a, you know, you're a permaculture site. And yes, you are. And let's think, what else can we include? You know? I'm going to tell everybody now, I am a revolutionary disguised as an organic gardener. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. Um, and so what that means is that you might start with an organic garden, and then you go, oh, well, I need to water my garden, so I'm going to catch some water off the roof, and I want to fertilize my garden, so I'm going to have a few chickens, and then all of a sudden, and then I need to build... Um, you know, uh, I need some trellises for my tomatoes or peas or beans, and I think I'll grow some bamboo and use the material, the columns for building trellises. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you're thinking on a larger, uh, a larger way of expanding just beyond a organics. more complete, yes. cyclical mm -hmm. way of of doing. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yes. So next. Um, so we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We are borrowing it from our children. So I like to just keep on remembering um, what's really important here. It's like we're just sort of a flash in the pan, and, you know, our children and our children's children and their children. I mean, that's really, really why we want to be caring for the earth as much as possible and making the changes now, um, just like with the whole climate situation is it's 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 now we must do it now and yeah. that's part of why I'm so fascinated with this whole systems thinking and and approach in, in many um, diverse um, opportunities for systems development mm -hmm. yeah so next so we're growing the earth for our next generation and the next so as sort of a wrap-up here, we've got permaculture design creates relationships between different systems or elements, and it's accomplished by closing the loops and integrating the land, water, plants, animals, structures, and people. That's really permaculture in a nutshell. And then I think there's one more slide. Um, there's a couple more. So the take-home, which I'm hoping you're, the audience will get from this, is that, um, that you can transform your life in many, in really simple ways. And what, could we have that slide again? Um, that if you're doing really um, 
creative design, you can minimize work and ma maximize effects. That the network of community enhances your journey working with other people. And that really permaculture is applied common sense. And that's, that's really, it all kind of makes sense. And that, um, that I'm just encouraging everyone to think like a designer. And then, uh, next slide. So change starts with thinking of solutions and not problems. And so here's just a lovely little drawing of catching rainwater, roof, um, some roof gardens, an electric car. And so um, again, you know, it's um, simple changes that can have great effects. Mm -hmm. And I think there's last slide is just, um, I think is, yeah, that's just me, Cascadia Permaculture, my name and my website and my email. And Cascadia Permaculture is the name of your consulting? One of, one of my businesses, yes. One I have Cascadia Permaculture, which is my teaching business and um, consultation on more permaculture-based things. And then Agroecology Northwest is uh, a business that I have for um, working with farmers, predominantly um, a, wide, a wide variety of farmers, to include these kinds of systems um, in, within their, um, their designs of their farms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Wilson Creek Gardens is my kind of home business. So many hats and somehow I juggle them all. And um, yeah. And do you have people come to visit you at Wilson Creek Gardens? Or I do. school groups? Yes. Or how, how does that work? Uh, I, ha I teach um, some workshops there and do tours periodically. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, just sort of walk around and talk about what's going on and share plants. And I don't have a set tour time, but um, people will call and we'll set up a time. Yeah, I think yeah. I would be interested in, in touring your, your little homestead That'd there. That'd be great, yeah. So um, why don't you tell me about one of your favorite design projects, you know, and all of the facets of the design and, and how they, they integrated with one another and the, the wishes of the inhabitants that had to be taken into account and you know mm. what all the local environmental factors were that figured in right now, i'd really like to hear a more detailed discussion of an you know a real life example sure uh, i'll give a, a more urban example because that's probably many of your viewers are more urban based and and uh, thinking about think about a, a city lot and you think about, um, you know, so, so we sit and we have a conversation. We're just really working with people and I have a questionnaire so that m my goal is to co-design a site with someone. I'm not going to come in and design it for them because I believe m the more they're invested in the outcome and, uh, and excuse me, more invested in the process of the design, the more they'll, they'll care and be able to manage the outcome. And so I'll have a sense of really what they want. And so as an example with edible landscaping, someone who, um, a design where they move on to a, 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 an existing site and there's lots of rhododendrons and there's lots of plants that are not as, as pr much production oriented. And one of the things that I, I really love to do is when I'm working and as an example that you like you to refer to, is um, where there's um, a, like a subdivision where the, everybody has lawns, and so um, and, uh, so I would I'll this one place or well, several places many places I'll, I'll come in and we'll lessen the front lawn and we'll kind of make it a kidney shape a pretty nice shape and then we'll start planting um, dwarf or semi dwarf fruit trees where there could be non food producing fruit trees. Um, we'll put blueberries in along as hedges and we'll put strawberries because they like that same um, acid environment. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then we'll look and see, well, where's the best place to put a water catchment, even just a little barrel. And so a classic example, and, and I kind of do the, you know, it's kind of the same idea for every place in a way because I'm utilizing those same strategies and the techniques are, depending on what people want, will be slightly different. And so um, 
will think about uh, as far as zoning is concerned, like now roof water, when I first started out, roof water catchment was not legal in, in Eugene. It was and not legal? It was not legal. It Why was not that? allowed. It was not permitted. Well, because we don't own the water. The state owns the water. So all the water that comes on the ground or on our roof, that's not ours. But they don't want, the state does not want us collecting tons and tons of water because then we're not recharging our aquifers. Um, that has slowly changed. I actually had um, got permitted the first uh, uh, rainwater catchment system in Eugene probably 12 years ago or something like that. And, and I had to go through all these hoops and, you know, the design, when I presented it to the city, they want, I, you know, I gave them lots of information. And when they finally stamped it, they said, please don't ever come back here. We're never going to, you know, this is the last one we're going to approve. Well, now, you know, eWeb, I think, is still, like, paying people to, you know, if they're disconnecting their waters. Um, I don't know if that's still happening, but it used to be that they would disconnect. If you disconnected the water spout, you'd get some sort of uh, rebate or something on your... So anyway, yes, it's an interesting thing how times change. I, I guess <laughs> I could understand that if you were diverting enormous amounts of water yeah. and sending them north or right. down to California. I know. But if yeah. you're simply collecting water in a rain barrel and then using it to water your fruit trees, it's going to get down into the ground anyway. It is true. It is true. I mean, that all sounds quite <clears throat> illogical to me. Well, there is a water master here. Every county has a water master. And... Um, and that is the person where, like, if you're going to have a pond, you need to get a permit for your pond. Uh, and so now what they're doing, from what I understand, is that large-scale large, large scale subdivisions, or any subdivisions now, have to have water collection. And so there is more, you know, wanting to keep the water on the land rather than moving it out into the Willamette River. So, so that's, that is a really interesting change that's happened over time. Gray water, water catchment, yes. And so then, you know, along with this system that we're talking about, you know, so, you know, where's the best place to put the chickens? Um, and, uh, and, and then, like, rabbits is also a wonderful urban animal to have, very quiet. We had rabbits. Our daughter wanted a dog, and we really didn't want to have a dog in town. And so we decided to get rabbits, and then I ended up just, you know, kind of cultivating that just mostly for their manure, only for their manure, really, and company. It was a great, great way for uh, our daughter to kind of learn responsible care of, anim of an animal and mm -hmm. some animals. So, yeah, so I don't know what else to say about that <laughs> system. So I guess I could go on and on. But <laughs> well, c can you think of a project where you've actually had to design structures that went along with the, the landscape features? So that is not my forte. I mm -hmm. will design... Um, an overview of a structure, but that's when, or and that's when a, a team member comes in. Mm -hmm. So, like, if somebody wants a house, I'm certainly not going to design a house, but I know people who I can refer to. Uh, if somebody wants a little storage shed, I can talk about location of where that is and materials that they want to use mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But that's uh, buildings are not my forte, and so I'm not going to um, take that one on. But you could at least say, you know of this space here makes the most sense to put the, the storage shed. Absolutely. Or here Absolutely. makes the most sense to have um, the chicken coop or, right, or that right. kind or of thing. Or a little pond or that or sort of thing, yeah. And I love outdoor rooms. I love designing spaces where you have arbors and a transition from like one room to another mm -hmm. so that even a small yard can make feel um, even bigger when you're having those kind of transition. So you maybe have a little hedge with an arbor and then you go into another space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun design and you can use grapes to grow over the arbor or a kibia or that sort of thing, yeah. And I know that you teach internationally. Um, well, that, I, um, yes, I guess that's true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think about, I, I teach in Canada. More well, that's, often. That's that in is the country. That's yes. international. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have not done that. So, yeah, okay. you know, you're, uh, you're ahead of me on that one. <laughs> but I was just wondering um, are other countries, or maybe I should just say Canada, is Canada further along the road in this way than we mm -hmm. are? Or are they kind of at the same place we are? What, what has been your reception there? And well, I really could, can talk on a global basis because permaculture is a global um, 
movement or a global design system. And, uh, and it is science-based. And, and so, so when we describe all these things, there is, there is um, research that's been done and scientifically proven that these things work together. And that, you know, like I talked about in Zimbabwe, there is a lot going on. There's a lot going on in um, um, Australia. Pretty much every country in the world is now uh, following permaculture in certain ways. Uh, Vietnamese, uh, in Vietnam, um, it's part of the school system, the, it's the education of permaculture. And uh, there's uh, international convergences that happen. I was lucky enough to go two years ago to Cuba. There was a wow. international convergence. And so there's people from all over the world and young people who are just coming in and just embracing people of all ages of course but for me it just it just, it just thrills me since I've been in this for so long and to see the changes that are happening mm -hmm. over time and that some people don't even use like for me I don't always even use the word permaculture in my consultation practice I'll start utilizing those strategies and then and then maybe you know and then introduce the term because it can be um, a little confusing for people. Mm -hmm. um, so in Canada, there is a lot going on with permaculture. I would say pretty much on par with the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I've taught in New York City, and I'm just fascinated with, um, uh, even in the big cities, you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York City, that there are people who are following these practices and teaching other people how to do the same thing. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that I recently completed my house. Yes, I live exciting. out in the country. I have five plus acres, mm -hmm. and I am doing all of the landscaping and hardscaping myself. Uh huh. And as I've listened to you talking about the principles of permaculture and the things that you think about and the, that goes into it, I'm thinking that's what I've been doing. Yay! I just didn't <laughs> know it. Yes. And I feel so encouraged mm -hmm. by that, and mm -hmm. it, it feels like instead of just kind of bumbling around and doing the best that I can in a haphazard kind of way, that maybe there was a method to this madness mm -hmm. and, and it's all kind of, kind of funneling toward a, a discernible and desirable end. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, that's, kind of, that's what I've aimed at, yes, of course. Right. But I've just kind of been feeling my way along mm -hmm. and, and trying to use common sense. And I, there it is. I, I think maybe it's going to work the yes. way I hoped it would. <laughs> yes, it is common sense. And it's also intuitive. Yeah. You know, there's sort yeah. of this sense that, oh, yes, it makes sense. Well, of course, it's really sunny here. Well, that's where I'm going to put the garden. And, and yes. Yeah, and yeah. watching <clears throat> where the sun hits different parts of the land. Um, which, which places drain well and which do not. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of plants grow naturally here and grow naturally there? I mean, it's just, th there is a lot of, um, yeah, intuitive, I think, is the mm -hmm. right word. Mm -hmm. of, and just observing and paying attention to what's yeah. actually happening out there. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's really been an adventure. Great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show mm -hmm. and My helping pleasure. to illuminate this fascinating topic. I really appreciate you being with mm -hmm. us today. Great. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks who don't mind the fragrance of rotting vegetation if it's in the <laughs> compost pile. Join us next week as we continue our voyage through the biosphere. See you then.